I want to talk for the next little while from the subject, undeniable evidence. But I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I am proof. I need you to just holler down your room and say, I am proof. You want to wonder if Jesus is real? If you have questions about him, I am living, breathing proof that he is alive and well. Be seated. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, there is no greater testimony than a changed life. There is no argument. There is no discussion. There is no debate. They that argue against change cannot deny proof of a significant change and transformation in your life. No verbal witness could ever affirm a change greater than a living, visible It's one thing to talk it. It's another thing to be it. Talking about you've been changed does not mean anything. But when you truly have been changed, you ain't got to say nothing. You just simply show up. And your case is one. Interesting enough is this text because it centers us upon the first persecution of the early church. It's the first time the church has been under fire. The first time. Here they are, the church being birthed in a very hostile environment in the Byzantium Empire, the time of the Byzantium Empire. And here they are dealing with anti-God, anti-Christ for the most part anti-Christ minds and mentality. They're plagued with um, they're plagued with violence that was of course perpetrated upon the church. It was a dangerous time to be saved. Dangerous time to be a Christian. They were killing Christians. They were not just trying to hurt their feelings but the church was birthed in the time where people were feel, fearing for their lives. The church was birthed in a time where people were being beheaded. They were being thrown in the Colosseum, Rome. They were being uh, burnt at the stake just for naming the name of Jesus Christ. Significant for me to say that is because just because you identified yourself with Jesus would be an automatic death sentence. None of us have ever known what it is to be under that kind of pressure and fire. That just because we identify ourselves as Christian, our lives have never been in jeopardy. The worst we have ever experienced is somebody just don't like us. And talk bad about your church. Talk bad about your pastor. That's the, that's the worst we have ever really dealt with. We have never known what it is for somebody to say, if you say his name, I'm going to blow your brains out. Uh, but the times are changing. We have not known it in America. But there are those in far countries even now, under the threat of ISIS, who takes pleasure in beheading people and videoing it just because they are Christian, just because they do not adhere to the Islamic faith. But in the middle of all of that, Peter and John took the advantage of the opportunity to preach Jesus. Mm. They, they, they taught the people, even under this kind of threat, they taught that Jesus was the answer. The religionists were of the, of the time were threatened by the preaching of Jesus, and particularly this thought. You've got to understand this. They were concerned about Peter and John's message about the resurrection. They, they were concerned because they had fought very hard and, and worked very hard to dispel the idea 
of a man being resurrected. But Peter and John understood that this message of resurrection would birth hope in the hearts of people and taking away the power of the religious order. Uh, they thought that if we would, if, if we can keep them silent about this resurrection business, if we could keep them from talking about this Jesus who got up on the third day, that we could keep the hope of the people incarcerated to the point that they would just buckle under the religious constraints that we put upon them. There is a freedom in knowing that Jesus lives. Songwriter put it like this, because he lives. Do I have a church here? I can face tomorrow. There is a freedom in your life. There is a, there is a comfort. Come on, church folk, talk to me. There is a comfort that you operate in knowing that it doesn't matter how bad it gets. Sooner or later, Jesus is going to show up. He's going to do something. I may be crying. I need some believers to say something. I may be crying today, but because I know Jesus, I know that it won't end like this. Well, David said it like this, weeping may endure for the night. But for all of you that know Jesus, you know that joy is coming in the morning. It's interesting that under all of this pressure and all under the, all of this hostility and in the this hostile environment, Peter and John preached the gospel. Oh, they preached the gospel. They preached the gospel. You know, I have I've been studying I've been studying religion and I've been studying Christianity, and it's interesting that the enemy in this hour in the 21st century has said, I've got to come up with a new strategy to fight Christians and to, to kind of, as it were, um, uh, dismantle the power of the church. And what he does is that he infiltrates the church. He does not set up a, he does not, he does not say, he does not go across the street and, and set up an anti-church. He sets up a church. Mm. And he sets up a philosophy, a church based on the philosophy of unaccountability, unfaithfulness, uncommitment, um, anything that requires any level of discipline. Watch what the, what, the, what the enemy is doing in this hour. He is setting up religious centers that don't require anything. And people are gathering, I, didn't, I think I'd get much help there, but people are gathering to hear things that tickle their ear massage their ego and stroke their intellect. They are gathering to hear stuff that is more philosophical than theological. They are gathering to hear messages that speak to their emotions and their flesh and the opinions of people as opposed to the gospel. But let me just take a check in here for all of you, and it may not be all of you, but for all of you that will admit to this, you only got saved because the gospel pricked you. It wasn't Norman Vincent Peale. Come on, talk to me. It wasn't somebody's philosophy. It was not somebody reading out of the Reader's Digest. It wasn't somebody giving you psychology today. Come on. It wasn't any of those things. It was the pure, unadulterated gospel. My brothers and sisters, if we would get back to preaching and teaching the gospel, we would see the results of the power of the gospel. Uh, our messages are way too complicated. Our messages have much too fluff in it. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna like this. I said, yeah, I'm gonna say it from the, from the preacher's position, uh, the pastor's position. Our messages have much too fat on it. And y'all know, y'all steak eaters, you know what I'm talking about when I say this, that there, that there is a value in the benefit of having the fat on it. it, it that, that marbleizing uh, adds to the flavor. When I want a ribeye and I get to choose it, I look at how much, because I know it's going to add to the taste. And, and if you're not careful, the enemy will have you eating a whole lot of fatty stuff. But, but can I tell you, 
What else has a whole lot of taste? When you have the bone in. I used to eat ribeyes boneless, but I discovered that there is a benefit of a bone in. Because the meat that's connected to the bone is drawing a whole nother level of seasoning and nutrients and flavor on a hill far away. If we would preach the gospel, we wouldn't have to worry about putting gravy on it. Because if you cook the meat right, the gravy makes, the meat makes its own. I need some cooks to talk to me. You ain't got to do all this extra stuff when you just preach the gospel because the gospel works by itself. Now, what is the gospel, Pastor? What is the gospel? Well, let me just put it like this. It is the life. It is the death. It is the burial. It is the resurrection. It is the ascension and the, oh God, and the imminent return of Jesus Christ. All that other stuff is just stuff we put in it. But a songwriter picked up this pen and said, I'm going to write me a true gospel song. He said, living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my, yes, Lord. Sins far away, rising, he justified. Freed me forever and one day. He's coming back. Five points to the gospel. Grace is the number, five is the number of grace. And the grace of God has appeared to all men. So, look at your name and tell them the gospel works. Even under persecution, the gospel works. Even under persecution, the gospel works. Even under uh, duress, the gospel works. Even when you ain't got no money, the gospel works. The gospel works if the lights go out. The gospel works if this mic don't work. Yes, Lord. The gospel works in air condition and it works in extreme heat. Uh, come on, talk to me. The gospel works in Walmart parking lot. The gospel works on your job. The gospel works with a ham and organ and without one. The gospel, I'm talking to somebody that needs to understand. The gospel works at your house. The gospel works in the street. The gospel works in the prison. The gospel works in the White House. And so we are commanded to preach the gospel because the gospel will work even under persecution. The Bible says that 5,000 were added to the church as a result of these two men who decided to preach the gospel. Oh, God, I feel you, Lord. I'm let me, <laughs> what would happen if we would create an agenda for the gospel? Mm. Uh, you, know, you know what's wrong with the church? You know what's wrong with this church? Some of y'all are only excited and engaged in your part of the church. And as long as it's your program, as long as you're in charge, as long as it's something that you have to do, then you are fully engaged. But in areas that speak to the benefit of the whole, you're not concerned about it. I'm amazed at how many people don't want to pray unless you are in charge of the prayer. I'm amazed at how many people will show up to your little group sessions but won't show up to Bible class. Y'all don't have to like this. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm amazed at people that don't want to witness to other people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, let me help you with this. This is not a social club. This is not a rotary club. This is not the Kiwanis. Help me here. This is not the Eastern Star nor the Masons. This is God's church. And he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. And the gospel, amen, the church is based on and built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. The Jesus movement had created a stir among the Sanhedrin. Oh, God, this Jesus movement. This Jesus movement was not um, a well-liked group. This Jesus movement was a group that made the status quo and the hierarchy uncomfortable. The Sanhedrin, which was the hierarchy of leadership and government in the Jewish order, 
was now uncomfortable with this Jesus movement. Oh, God, help me here. He, they, were, they were uncomfortable with these Jesus people because these Jesus people had not been to Claflin. These Jesus people had not graduated from state. These Jesus people did not have an associates from OC Tech. These Jesus people had not finished their master's degree at USC. These Jesus people had not gone to Voorhees or Denmark. I don't, y'all could just sit here. These Jesus people didn't have pedigree. These Jesus people, amen, did not make six figures. These Jesus people people, God help me, did not have an NBA behind their name. These Jesus people were not PhD. These Jesus people did not have, amen, as it were, MDivs. I know some of y'all think that your Holy Ghost and your salvation got something to do with the school you graduated from, but let me help you with this. Not by power, yes, Lord, nor by might, but by my spirit. Saith the Lord of hosts, it's all right to be educated. It's important to be educated. But let me help you with this. You don't need a degree. A degree does not qualify you for the anointing. Oh, God. Jesus put it like this. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he hath anointed me. Hallelujah. James Harris from uh, uh, Virginia Union said something so powerful last week, and it's stuck in my spirit. It's stuck in my throat. He said, listen, who lays hands on you does not define, amen, does not qualify who you are. Mm. Yes, Lord. Uh, amen. Where you get your papers from does not really tell who you are in God. Amen. Where you've been degreed does not really, amen, announce who you are in God. But the only thing, amen, that gives me credibility this morning is my message. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. I done forgot when I got ordained. I don't remember the details of when they put the robe on me and when and then they gave me the papers. I have a bl it's blurry to me when I took the test but when I stand here and the Holy Ghost stands up in me it tells me that this is the only thing that qualifies you is the message. So the message has to be Jesus and not you. Paul said we preach Jesus. We preach Christ and not ourselves. The Sanhedrin was concerned because they said we got to do something about these Jesus people because their influence is far more reaching than ours. They are touching people that we don't want to talk to. Oh, God. They're having conversations with people that would never come in our circle. And if we don't slow them down, well, it kind of reminds me of something that happened, oh, God, almost 4,000 years prior to this. Kind of reminds me of something, Elder Donald, that happened in the book of Exodus, chapter number one. There arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. And he said, we got to do something because these Jews keep on growing. And the more, yes, Lord, we got to do something to slow them down because if they don't, they're going to outnumber us. And if they outnumber us, they may overtake us. But the Bible says, Lord, I pray, I praise you for this. The word of the Lord said, the more they afflicted them, Nobody, huh? The more they grew. So it seems to me like God uses affliction to cause you to grow. So for all of you that's sitting up like you sucking on sour lemons and mad about what's going on in your life, I want to I want to help you with this. Affliction is a sign that you're growing. Persecution is a sign that the enemy's afraid of you. Because he don't bother people that he's not intimidated by. Hallelujah. If you just going on in the flower bed of these and nothing is wrong in your life, it means that you don't mean nothing to the enemy. But the moment you start praying, the moment God starts you doing in your life what he promised, watch out for affliction. Look out for persecution because it's coming. But the Bible says the more they afflicted them, the more they grew. Sound like babies, kids to me.
Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, we don't die. We multiply. Sound like gremlins to me. You put some water on me trying to drown me. But what you don't understand is that the water, the washing of the water, yes, Lord, the washing of the water through the water is causing me to multiply and grow. So, so the question becomes, question becomes, watch, listen to the question. By what power or by what name? Because is y'all in the text with me? Verse 7 said, what power and what name? The concern was we got to kill the influence of this Jesus. Because <laughs> We want to figure out how y'all operating in so much power. Because the university didn't teach us power. They taught us method, but they didn't teach us power. Seminary don't give you preaching power. You don't go to school. You learn, you go to school to learn the craft, but that don't give you power. We want to figure out how y'all laying hands on folk and they recovering. See, we don't want to talk about this no more, but we're living in an hour where the people of God, the church does not want to be consecrated. Oh, let me, let me make you pout before I make you shout. We don't want to be consecrated. We don't want to live because consecration requires denial. Consecration des uh, uh, demands that you give up you. Consecration demands demands that you don't do everything you want to do all the time when you want to do it. Consecration uh, demands sacrifice. And these men of God, they lived a life that was sacrificial. They lived under pressure. They lived under persecution. And I pray to God every day that God does not have to bring calamity to South Carolina. <laughs> that God does not allow... <laughs> I mean, what other countries have experienced uh, to come to Orangeburg County uh, to make us run in here and pray. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I pray that it doesn't take you getting evicted. It doesn't take your house burning down. Uh, Y'all don't want to preach with me. I pray it doesn't take you getting a pink slip before you turn back to Jesus. I pray that it does not take him beating you in your head before you realize that there ought to be nobody more important in your life than Jesus. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. I pray, oh my God, I'm shy. I pray that God don't have to strip me from every blessing before I lift my hands and sacrifice and give him praise. Throw your hands up and say, Lord, don't take it all from me. Oh, God, don't take my family. I don't want to have to bury my kids before I honor you like I should. Oh, y'all y'all just keep sitting there. I don't want to have to lose everything I work for before I tell my family that they need to be saved. I don't want it to be said too late. Say, what name, what power? What power, what name? And yeah, this is verse 8. And I love this. It is the power of the Holy Ghost that gives us boldness to carry out the Great Commission. Mm. The Bible says, and Peter. And Peter, and Peter, and Peter, not filled with philosophy, but Peter being filled with, now I understand the Holy Ghost was not this. 
No, no, no. Peter being filled with the consciousness and the intellect and the authority of God. When you know that you have the download and the download has been complete and you can open up you can open up the document and everything that's on the document that you need is now available to you when your computer tells you that the download is complete. Which, And if you got one of them fancy computers or fancy devices, they tell you how much percentage while it's happening. But my computer tells me when it's finished, it says download complete. Ain't preaching with me, y'all. Y'all bored. Let me try another section. Um, when the download is complete, all the info that I've been looking for is now at my disposal. When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, the download is complete, which means now you have access to the power, and then the enemy. Wants to tell you that you can't get to it. But Jesus said, I'm going to give you the password to make sure you get to the power. The password is J-E-S-U-S. By, by, by what? By what power? I know Steve Jobs was an atheist, but I love his product. Because the beautiful thing about an apple is it don't crash too often. Because it's made in such a way that it prevents all of that stuff. You need to make sure that you got the right equipment. Because when you in a pinch, you don't need nothing that's going to slow you down. I was sitting on the pulpit uh, on the stage here uh, uh, a little earlier, and I was trying to access the Wi-Fi because I was trying to uh, Facebook Live and Periscope the, the young ladies dancing. And uh, it told me connection too poor. So I couldn't connect. Bernice, I couldn't connect to the Internet that would give me access. So I said to Deacon Knapp, I said, go get me the password for the extended thing that we put in the, in the room. And when I put this long code in, when I put in the password, immediately. Oh, Lord, give me a church that loves you. I, immediately. What I could not get to before. As soon as I put in the password, I came to tell about 13 and a half of y'all, if you use the password, what was blocked before, what, couldn't, what you could not have access to before, if you use the right password, immediately, I don't know who this is for, but somebody's been praying for something a long time and you're frustrated because you feel like you've been praying. But the reality is you've not been praying, you've been complaining. Because Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, y'all ain't saying nothing. No, I've been praying. I pray in the morning. I pray in the evening. I pray every day about it. But when was the last time you stopped praying? And said, let me just put this password in. And say, God, I, uh, God, you know how bad I feel. You know how bad I need you to do it. No, 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 no. At some point, you just got to put the password in and press sin and tell the devil go to hell where you came from because now I have immediate access the other thing the other thing that the Bible says that I thought was interesting in verse number 8 is that we see Peter's we see Peter's disposition Peter, by nature, 
Wasn't no punk. He, he wasn't afraid. I guess that's a better word. He, give me some more here so I can. He, he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid. But when he got the Holy Ghost, it kicked his confidence into another level. The Holy Ghost does not make you conceited. It makes you confident. So anytime, watch this, anytime you see people operating in pride and conceit, it should tell you something about... See, because your talent makes you conceited. Your gifting and your skill makes you conceited. You really think you that good. But the Holy Ghost reminds you that without me, I wish I asked about three people in here to know what I'm talking about. Anybody in here that know that there's been some situations? Even right now, you look back, you don't even know how you came through it. You don't know how and when it stopped. You don't know when God turned it around. You don't know what was said or what was done. All you know is that the Holy Ghost. Have you ever been in a situation and God give you the right words at the right time? Have you ever been in a situation and God calm your nerves? God calm your spirit. The Holy Ghost tell you, hold your peace. Don't say anything. I'm telling you right now, that's not your skill. That's not what you've been taught in this classroom. That is the power of the Holy Ghost. Peter, Peter started preaching this, and uh, Peter started talking to them, and he now, he answers them, and he said, I'm glad y'all asked, because I, I, I got confidence enough to tell you exactly what's been on my mind. First of all, since y'all want to check me on doing something good, the man, the man was lame. You know what's really weird? How many critics you'll have for doing stuff good? Lord, help me say that. I'm amazed at how many folks sit in church and are critical of what the pastor does. Yeah, I'm going to preach while I'm at it, honey. I didn't warm up the car. Let's make sure we... I'm, I'm, I'm so amazed that so many folks sit out there and, man, we ought to be doing this. We ought to be doing that. And my only job, the crux of my assignment is to help you just get something from God that encourages you and strengthens you and supports you. I'm amazed at people in your life. Have you ever seen people in your life that you try to help? And they are critical of everything you try to do. But I got me a new papa, got a brand new bag. I can't pastor who I can't pastor, and I'm going to stop trying. And I'm not going to beg you to take my love. Not doing Ain't running after nobody. Ain't chasing nobody. Ain't doing it. Because I know what I'm here for. I know what I've been here for. I know what I pray for. For God to bless your life. For God to give you a job. For God to hit men your family. It's amazing to me. Amazing to me. Folks got so much commentary on what the church ain't doing. When the whole premise of the church is to make your life better. Only reason why we are here is to make lives better. Come on, I need some church folk in here. I need some kingdom lifers in here. The only reason why we come here is to help somebody get stronger and encourage somebody to walk with God. That's why we're here. This ain't no ATM. This ain't no bank. That ain't the purpose of this. We are here. Y'all ain't gonna like this. But we are here to make sure. You know why you ought to be here? So to make sure everybody on the road sitting next to you gets closer to God. If they thought it was important enough to get out of their bed and to come to the house of God, we got to get rid of the politics and all the other ticks. 
and blood suckers and leeching ministry and make sure that we give life to people. Oh God, I want you to do me a favor. Let's restore the purpose of the church. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, in the name of Jesus, I command you to be blessed. I command your family to be blessed. May you hear a word today that strengthens your life, that strengthens your spirit, that encourages your soul. If we ain't doing that, we are not the church. Y'all want to bring me up on charges for helping somebody? Talk about my bad. But don't bother me for my good. Don't bother me because I'm trying to help folk. See, Jesus had that. Okay, let me not get into that. But uh, They were always bringing Jesus up on charges when he was trying to help folk that the church folk and the religious folk didn't want to be bothered with. And I'm going to tell you this. When God anoints you and gives you what it takes to help and bless people, you'll always have people who ain't got what you have, don't have what you have, always critical. I'm amazed at how many cr critics we have. You know, I was thinking about something. It, it was amazing to me. Uh, the other night I was watching the NBA final, and I was listening to uh, uh, the commentators uh, uh, on the game. And then, and then the screen flashed to them, and I thought about the fact that it's easy when you sitting with a suit on and you ain't got all these sets of arms in your face, it's easy for you to tell me I should have made that shot. Ain't nobody guarding you. It's, it's, it's really easy. It's really easy to listen to Howard Cosell and all of them back in the day, we were commentate, commentating on the boxing matches and couldn't last three minutes. Three seconds, thank you. A, a, a round is three minutes long. The reality is, let him hit you once. Oh my God, he should have blocked. Oh my God. Oh, oh, what was he thinking? You sitting on the outside of the you sitting on the outside of the ring ain't never put no gloves on in your life. Stop letting people talk you out of what you know God has given you. So so here's I ain't gonna be able to finish this. I can see it now. But but listen to this. He says, be it known unto you, all the people of Israel, in the name, Lord, this is a good preaching point for me, in the name of Jesus, whoo, whom you crucified, since you won't go there. Let's talk about the one who you killed and you didn't think he was worth anything. You didn't think he was too great, and you killed him with your hypocrite and self because the reason you killed him is because you did think he was great. But you underestimated his greatness because you thought that if you killed him, that would be the end of him. But let me help you with this. The one who you killed, God raised him up. God raised Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you. God raised Jesus from the dead. And that same resurrection power that was in Jesus is now in me. And when I open my mouth and summon the name of Jesus... Just the way God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm going to raise every dead situation that's around me. 
Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, use the password. 